The Eastern Front of World War I in Russian sources was a major theater of operations that encompassed at its greatest extent the entire frontier between the Russian Empire and Romania on one side and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire and Germany on the other. It stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south included most of Eastern Europe and stretched deep into Central Europe as well. The term contrasts with Western Front, which was being fought in Belgium and France. In the opening months of the war, the Imperial Russian Army attempted an invasion of Eastern Prussia in the Northwestern Theater, only to be beaten back by the Germans after some initial success. At the same time, in the south, they successfully invaded Galicia, defeating the Austro-Hungarian forces there. In Russian Poland, the Germans failed to take Warsaw, but by 1915, the German and Austro-Hungarian armies were on the advance, dealing the Russians heavy casualties in Galicia and in Poland, forcing it to retreat. Grand Duke Nicholas was sacked from his position as the commander-in-chief and replaced by the Tsar himself. Several offensives against the Germans in 1916 failed, including Lake Narok Offensive and the Baranovici Offensive. However, General Alexei Brusi Lov oversaw a highly successful operation against Austria-Hungary that became known as the Brusi Lov Offensive, which saw the Russian army make large gains. The Kingdom of Romania entered the war in August 1916. The Entente promised the region of Transylvania in return for Romanian support. The Romanian army invaded Transylvania and had initial successes, but was forced to stop and was pushed back by the Austro-Hungarians when Bulgaria attacked them in the south. Meanwhile, a revolution occurred in Russia in February 1917. Tsar Nicholas II was forced to abdicate and a Russian provisional government was founded, with Georgi Lvov as its first leader, who was eventually replaced by Alexander Kerensky. The newly formed Russian Republic continued to fight the war alongside Romania and the rest of the Entente until it was overthrown by the Bolsheviks. In October 1917, Kerensky oversaw the July Offensive, which was largely a failure and caused a collapse in the Russian army. The new government established by the Bolsheviks signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Central Powers, taking it out of the war and making large territorial concessions. Romania was forced to surrender and signed a similar treaty, though both of the treaties were nullified with the surrender of the Central Powers in November 1918. Geography. The front in the east was much longer than that in the west. The theatre of war was roughly delimited by the Baltic Sea in the west and Minsk in the east, and St. Petersburg in the north and the Black Sea in the south, a distance of more than 1,600 kilometres. This had a drastic effect on the nature of the warfare. While World War I on the Western Front developed into trench warfare, the battle lines on the Eastern Front were much more fluid and trenches never truly developed. This was because the greater length of the front ensured that the density of soldiers in the line was lower so the line was easier to break. Once broken, the sparse communication networks made it difficult for the defender to rush reinforcements to the rupture in the line, mounting rapid counter-offensives to seal off any breakthrough. Propaganda Propaganda was a key component of the culture of World War I. It was most commonly deployed through the state-controlled media to glorify the homeland and demonize the enemy. Propaganda often took the form of images which portrayed stereotypes from folklore about the enemy or from glorified moments from the nation's history. In the Eastern Front, propaganda took many forms such as opera, film, spy fiction, theater, spectacle, war novels and graphic art. Across the Eastern Front the amount of propaganda used in each country varied from state to state. Propaganda took many forms within each country and was distributed by many different groups. Most commonly the state produced propaganda, but other groups, such as anti-war organizations, also generated propaganda. Initial situation in belligerent countries 
Germany prior to the outbreak of war. German strategy was based almost entirely on the Schlieffen Plan. With the Franco-Russian agreement in place, Germany knew that war with either of these combatants would result in war with the other, which meant that there would be war in both the West and the East. Therefore, the German general staff, Alfred von Schlieffen, planned a quick, all-out ground war on the Western Front to take France and, upon victory, Germany would turn its attention to Russia in the East. However, for this plan to be successful, von Schlieffen knew that Germany would need, at the very least, British neutrality. If Germany could assure British neutrality if she invaded France, she believed she would be able to defeat France quickly enough to prepare to defend herself against any Russian retaliation. Von Schlieffen believed Russia would not be ready or willing to move against and attack Germany due to the huge losses of military equipment that Russia suffered in the Russo-Japanese War. However, Germany's foreign policy at the time was not guided towards gaining the support of Britain. A German-British naval arms race would prove to be detrimental to gaining British support. Moreover, General von Moltke the Younger recognized that the German Navy was preparing itself to attack Britain, but due to an institutional oversight that made it impossible to coordinate the Army and Navy. The general had no direct influence or control over the German Navy. This meant that the general, who needed British support, could not stop the German Navy from attacking Britain. Von Moltke's inability to ensure British neutrality would prove to be particularly devastating to Germany's plan to quickly defeat France and focus its military force toward an Eastern Front. Conversely, the German Navy believed it could be victorious over Britain with Russian neutrality, something which von Moltke knew would not be possible. Romania In the immediate years preceding the First World War, the Kingdom of Romania was involved in the Second Balkan War on the side of Serbia, Montenegro, Greece and the Ottoman Empire against Bulgaria. The Treaty of Bucharest, signed on August 10, 1913, ended the Balkan conflict and added 6,960 square kilometers to Romania's territory. Although militarized, Romania decided upon a policy of neutrality at the start of the First World War, mainly due to having territorial interests in both Austria-Hungary and in Russia. Strong cultural influences also affected Romanian leanings, however, King Carol I, as a Hohenzollern Sigmaringen, favored his Germanic roots, while the Romanian people, influenced by their Orthodox Church and Latin-based language, were inclined to join France. Perhaps King Carol's attempts at joining the war on the side of the Central Powers would have been fruitful had he not died in 1914. But Romanian disenchantment with Austria-Hungary had already influenced public and political opinion. French endorsement of Romanian action against Bulgaria, and support of the terms of the Treaty of Bucharest was particularly effective at inclining Romania towards the Entente. Furthermore, Russian courting of Romanian sympathies, exemplified by the visit of the Tsar to Constanta on June 14, 1914, signaled in a new era of positive relations between the two countries. Nevertheless, King Ferdinand I of Romania maintained a policy of neutrality, intending to gain the most for Romania by negotiating between competing powers. According to historian John Keegan, the enticements offered by the Allies were never concrete, for in secret, Russia and France agreed not to honor any conventions when the end of the war came. Russia The immediate reason for Russia's involvement in the First World War was a direct result of the decisions made by the statesmen and generals. During July 1914, the July crisis was the culmination of a series of diplomatic conflicts that took place in the decades prior to 1914, and this is fundamental to an understanding of Russia's position immediately prior to the war. According to D. C. Levin, Russia was a formidable force that was able to back up her diplomatic policies with force. In 1870-1914, the four leading powers in Europe were Russia, Prussia, Austria and France. 
each of whom exercised a similar proportion of power at the time. One of the most significant factors in bringing Russia to the brink of war was the downfall of her economy. The 20% jump in defense expenditure during 1866-77 and in 1871-5 forced them to change their position within Europe and shift the balance of power out of her favor. At the time, Russian infrastructure was backward and the Russian government had to invest far more than its European rivals in structural changes. In addition there were overwhelming burdens of defense, which would ultimately result in an economic downfall for the Russians. This was a major strain on the Russian population, but also served as a direct threat to military expenditure. Thus the only way the Russians could sustain the strains of European war would be to place more emphasis on foreign investment from the French who essentially came to Russia's aid for industrial change. The Franco-Russian alliance allowed for the Russian defense to grow and aid the European balance of power during the growth of the German Empire's might. In 1914, Germany was the most powerful state in all of Europe. Nevertheless, one of the key factors was that of the Russian foreign policy between 1890 and 1914. Russian propaganda In order for the Russians to legitimize their war efforts the government constructed an image of the enemy through state instituted propaganda. Their main aim was to help overcome the legend of the invincible German war machine in order to boost the morale of civilians and soldiers. Russian propaganda often took the form of showing the Germans as a civilized nation with barbaric and human traits. Russian propaganda also exploited the image of the Russian POWs who were in the German camps, again in order to boost the morale of their troops serving as encouragement to defeat the enemy and to get their fellow soldiers out of the inhuman German POW camps. A key element of the Russian propaganda was the Investigate Commission formed in April 1915. It was led by Alexei Krivsov and the study was tasked with the job of studying the legal violations committed by of the Central Powers and then getting this information to the Russian public. This commission published photographs of letters that were allegedly found on fallen German soldiers. These letters document the German correspondents saying to take no prisoners. A museum was also set up in Petrograd, which displayed pictures that showed how inhumanly the Germans were treating prisoners of war. Austria-Hungary Austria-Hungary's participation in the outbreak of World War I has been neglected by historians as emphasis has traditionally been placed on Germany's role as the prime instigator. However, the spark that ignited the First World War is attributed to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavrilo Princip, which took place on June 28, 1914. Approximately a month later, on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. This act led to a series of events that would quickly expand into the First World War. Thus, the Habsburg government in Vienna initiated the pivotal decision that would begin the conflict. The causes of the Great War have generally been defined in diplomatic terms, but certain deep-seated issues in Austria-Hungary undoubtedly contributed to the beginnings of the First World War. The Austro-Hungarian situation in the Balkans pre-1914 is a primary factor in its involvement in the war. The movement towards South Slav unity was a major problem for the Habsburg Empire, which was facing increasing nationalist pressure from its multinational populace. As Europe's third largest state, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy was hardly homogeneous, comprising over 50 million people and 11 nationalities. The empire was a conglomeration of a number of diverse cultures, languages, and peoples. Specifically, the South Slavic people of Austria-Hungary desired to amalgamate with Serbia in an effort to officially solidify their shared cultural heritage. Over 7 million South Slavs lived inside the empire, while 3 million lived outside it. With the growing emergence of nationalism in the 20th century, unity of all South Slavs looked promising. This tension is exemplified by Konrad von Hotzendorf's letter to Franz Ferdinand, 
The unification of the South Slav race is one of the powerful national movements which can neither be ignored nor kept down. The question can only be whether unification will take place within the boundaries of the monarchy, that is at the expense of Serbia's independence, or under Serbia's leadership at the expense of the monarchy. The cost to the monarchy would be the loss of its South Slav provinces and thus of almost its entire coastline. The loss of territory and prestige would relegate the monarchy to the status of a small power. The annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1908 by Austrian Foreign Minister Baron von Ehrenthal in an effort to assert domination over the Balkans, inflamed Slavic nationalism and angered Serbia. Bosnia-Herzegovina became a rallying cry for South Slavs, with hostilities between Austria-Hungary and Serbia steadily increasing. The situation was ripe for conflict, and when Serbian Princip assassinated Austrian Ferdinand, these long-standing hostilities culminated into an all-out war. The Allied powers wholeheartedly supported the Slavs' nationalistic fight. George Macaulay Trevelyan, a British historian, saw Serbia's war against Austria-Hungary as a war of liberation that would free South Slavs from tyranny, in his own words. If ever there was a battle for freedom, there is such a battle now going on in southeastern Europe against Austrian and Magyar. If this war ends in the overthrow of the Magyar tyranny, an immense step forward will have been taken toward racial liberty and European peace. Russia prior to 1914 Prior to 1914, the Russians' lack of success in war and diplomacy in the six decades before 1914 sapped the country's moral strength. The triumphs of Britain and Germany in the martial, diplomatic and economic spheres put these countries in the front rank of the world's leading nations. This was a source of national pride, self-confidence and unity. It helped reconcile the worker to the state and the Bavarian or Scotsman to rule from Berlin or London. In the years prior to 1914, Austro-Russian cooperation was both crucial for European peace and difficult to maintain. Old suspicions exacerbated by the Bosnian crisis stood in the way of agreement between the two empires, as did ethnic sensitivities. Russia's historical role as liberator of the Balkans was difficult to square with Austria's determination to control adjacent territories. In 1913-4 St. Petersburg was too concerned with its own weakness and what it saw as threats to vital Russian interests. To spare much thought for Vienna's feelings, the Russians were, with some justice, Indignant that the concessions they had made after the First Balkan War in the interest of European peace had not been reciprocated by the Central Powers. This was doubly dangerous given the growing evidence flowing into Petersburg about Germany's aggressive intentions. Both Bazarov and the agents of the Russian secret political police in Germany reported the concern aroused in public opinion by the press war against Russia, which raged in the spring of 1914. First combat the war in the east began with the Russian invasion of East Prussia on 17 August 1914 and the Austro-Hungarian province of Galicia. The first effort quickly turned to a defeat following the Battle of Tannenberg in August 1914. A second Russian incursion into Galicia was completely successful, with the Russians controlling almost all of that region by the end of 1914 routing four Austrian armies in the process. Under the command of Nikolai Ivanov and Alexei Brusilov, the Russians won the Battle of Galicia in September and began the siege of Przemysl, the next fortress on the road towards Krakow. This early Russian success in 1914 on the Austro-Russian border was a reason for concern to the Central Powers and caused considerable German forces to be transferred to the east to take pressure off the Austrians, leading to the creation of the new German Ninth Army. At the end of 1914, the main focus of the fighting shifted to central part of Russian Poland, west of the River Vistula. The October Battle of the Vistula River and the November Battle of Łódź brought little advancement for the Germans, but at least kept the Russians at a safe distance. 
The Russian and Austro-Hungarian armies continued to clash in and near the Carpathian Mountains throughout the winter of 1914-1915. Przemysl's ill fortress managed to hold out deep behind enemy lines throughout this period, with the Russians bypassing it in order to attack the Austro-Hungarian troops further to the west. They made some progress, crossing the Carpathians in February and March 1915, but then the German relief helped the Austrians stop further Russian advances. In the meantime, Przemysl was almost entirely destroyl and the siege of Przemysl ended in a defeat for the Austrians.